April is National Financial Literacy Month. It's no secret that far too many Americans are in the dark when it comes to how best to manage their finances. So what's the solution? And why aren't schools doing enough to educate students about money? Let's bring in our panel for more. Carmen Rita Wong is a personal finance author, and Tina Powell is the CEO of She Capital, an investment management platform. It's great to see both of you. Welcome. Thank you. Great to be here. So just to give our viewers some context, Back in 2004, the Senate actually passed a resolution calling April Financial Literacy Month. So, Carmen, what does this month mean for you? Oh, well, it means a lot of talking, <laughs> but it means a lot of education and focus on financial literacy, which we absolutely need more of. This country has a real lack of understanding of how important it is to get the education in as early as possible with our children and as much as possible. Gina? So what we're doing is we're really reaching out to some of the universities and so we're getting on campus. We're bringing the literacy back into the classroom, back into the groups and making it real and making it touchable and hearable. And that's a great point because I want to put up this map showing which states teach financial literacy the best. And, and as you can see there, only 10% of states got an A when it comes to how well they teach personal finance. So Carmen, that's pretty bad. Yeah, it's pretty bad, isn't it? It's it's it, if you had to do it on a, on a rate of fail, um, a grade of less than fifty percent, pretty much is a big fat F for the whole nation, right? But some states are doing well. Here's the thing: only a certain amount of states actually have a requirement to teach personal finance, and even that's just one course. So if only seventeen states have to teach one course, if you could imagine all of the stuff that we do all the time, all the education, just in that one hour, you know, every day or every week. It's just not enough. The rest of the country needs to understand that this is really vital, just as vital as all the other classes that kids take in school because this is actual utility. This is something that they will learn back way back in the day there was home economics, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which was maintaining your they they actually had budgeting right. in those days. So this should be integrated into curriculum across the country so that we're not getting financial education only from where most people get it from at home, which may not be the best advice, or from financial institutions who obviously have a motive. And I want to talk about that in a moment, but yeah. you know, why aren't we seeing schools take this seriously? I mean, you would think the 2008 financial crisis would have shown everyone that we need to teach personal finance in schools. Well, so there's a saying in schools that if they don't test it, they don't teach it. Mm. So while the emphasis right now is on SATs and ACTs mm. getting into college, there's only so much margin that a teacher has that he or she can actually integrate these lessons in the classroom. And that's why we're not seeing it. So Carmen, if schools aren't doing their part and we have kids spending eight hours a day learning subjects that they may not use, should parents step in and sort of fill in that gap? And if so, where do they begin? What's step one for them? Well, they kind of need to. There isn't much of a choice there. But here's the thing. You mentioned the teachers and the testing. Whether it's parents teaching you or the teachers teaching you, they also need education mm. because not all parents actually have the right advice. They, have, they don't have the right education themselves. Teachers also need to be educated on how to teach this. So there's actually a whole kind of top-down process that we need to happen. We need to educate more parents. We need to educate more families, more women who tend to trickle down more information to the, to the family, and also the teachers as well. So if you can step into that role as a parent and see it as, it as your responsibility, just as you teach them about other things, even if it's so much as, you know, no, you can't have that because because it's not part of your allowance. Whatever you're teaching them, make it part of your day if they're not doing it at school to explain things and sit down and go over credit card statements, go over some bills. You don't have to share everything so they don't tell other people, other kids in the family, but and then school. But just sit down and actually practically show them how this all works. I know that's how I was raised. That's how I knew how these things happen. I checking account at 12, take them to the bank with you. But that's another great point because there's not just a financial literacy crisis yeah. among kids, it's also adults too. So out of all the financial topics out there, credit, debt, savings, retirement, what's one thing, what's the most important concept adults should be, should be you oh know, taking goodness. from this? That is of a all huge the financial question. Topics. Huge question. I would say the, the number one thing, once math is understood, even before math, simple addition, it's just limits. Hmm. Just limits. Just, That's discipline. And, and, it's, and it's discipline, but it's also just understanding that if you have one dollar, what it can do, and you have a limit, because that teaches things like debt. Hmm. It teaches value, right? So in a sense, not value, intrinsic value, but it teaches how much you can do with what, and if you want to do more, you're going to need to borrow more, or you just can't have it. 
But that essential understanding of limits is something that you can teach a five-year-old or a four-year-old. And I know that I did that with my daughter. And, and then you grow from there. Tina, do you I, agree? Yeah, so I would agree. Definitely the practice of delayed gratification is just, it's fundamental if you're going to grow and if you're going to um, put away any, anything in the, in the future, you've got to make sure that your wants and your needs are within your reach. The other thing I want to add on is the practice of compounding. Mm. Um, and so the principle of compounding, which may or may not, some of the high schools may or not, may not be touching it, and the fact that, you know, look, what you started with and you let that grow over time, the base increases, let your money work for you, work smarter, don't work harder. And that's actually a great segue to my next point because I want to talk about the stock market. This is so important. Many experts agree the stock market is key to building wealth, but after the 2008 crisis, far too many investors sold their stocks out of fear only to watch the markets recover several years later. Of course, hindsight is 2020. Take a look at this. The S&P 500 is up 200% since its March 2009 low. Look at that. So Carmen, what's your take on the stock market? I mean, that's key to building wealth, right? <laughs> Do you have a few hours, a few months? <laughs> um, listen, it, there are a couple of keys to building wealth, and that is a one essential point. When you're talking about youth and compounding, Tina, you're very, very right. Getting them to understand, because young people will say, you know, well, I don't have money. You know, I'm only getting paid a small amount, and I have student loan debt, and I have credit card debt. I can't put money away. I can't buy insurance. I can't do these basics, right? You're rich when you're young. You're rich with time. And in terms of compounding, in terms of saving, understanding the value of what you have, there's all sorts of capital. We've got the stock market capital. We've got equity in homes. We've got time. All these things are capital, understanding that. But understanding the role that investing in the markets plays in your life and should play. I know that my dad raised me and said, listen, your first job, if they offer you 401k, and take now it. <laughs> take it because it's leaving money on the table. Especially that match especially. So that's literally walking away from money somebody's putting in front of you. You have to understand that and visualize that. As for market crashes, these things happen, what goes up must come down. You need to understand what it means and how you should react and know that for most Americans, this is a long game. You are in it for the long haul. That means that you should not be going in there and checking your 401k every day. You really should understand that if you take out that money, you're locking in a loss. But Tina, people are afraid to invest in stocks. I mean, look at the first three months of 2016. We had so much volatility. How do you overcome that fear? Because a lot of people think, look, the markets are rigged against me, so why even bother? So first of all, you have to ground that fear in that way of thinking. And that, yes, fear is really, fear is harmful. It's harmful to the average investor. You have to be careful and guard your mind against what we're hearing and what we're seeing. The, the bottom line is that the fundamentals of a lot of U.S. companies are still good. It's still a great place to be as opposed to some emerging markets where they, there may be more risk. So let's understand the risk profile of investing in the U.S. market. And it's not to say that you should put 100% of your eggs into one basket, but it should absolutely, essentially, especially for the millennials, Equities have a place in the portfolio. The concentrations as you age and depending on your situation, that's going to change. But it absolutely has a place. It has a place in all of our portfolios, and that won't change. All right, we'll leave it there. I want to thank Carmen Rita Wong and Tina Powell from She Capital. Guys, thanks so much. This is a great conversation. Thanks for having thank us. Thank you. I'm Scott Gam, and you're watching The Street.